going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. We're going to talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what that means, where that comes from, and the purpose of that. Um, before we begin, let's just, be, let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer again. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the snow, just simply because we know it's almost over. I thank you, Lord, that driving here in the snow we got here to the church, opened up the door, and heard all the birds singing in the trees. What a blessing that was to hear bird song. We know spring's right around the corner, Lord, and we thank you for that. And Father, as we go into this message, Lord, I pray that you, you just write these words in, your, in our hearts, Lord. I pray that your word strikes us and, and convicts us and holds us strong. I pray that our eyes are open, our ears are open as we read this, and give me the words that you once spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to have you bounce around your Bibles a little bit today, so stay with me, but we're going to start in Acts 2. Acts 2, verses 38 and 39. I said we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, and that's where it starts. So We know right after Pentecost is when this happened, just to, to set some context there, and Peter is emboldened. Up until that point, Peter has not stepped out as a leader, and here's where he steps out as a leader, and he makes this statement. Verses 38 and 39. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In 39, it continues and says, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. That's a that's a powerful statement in and of itself. First of all, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit will be there. And what I what I love about this these verses the most is where it says, "The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off." This is a continuing promise. This is not a one-time thing that was. Within the context, even right there, Peter was saying, you and your children and your children's children and all those people far off. All through the generations, this has been available to us. Okay, For the last, for the last 2,000 years, this has been available to us. Well, when we talk about it in that, in that terminology, we need to understand what that means. And I want to talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We hear that phrase, we hear that terminology, what does it mean? Well, the Holy Spirit indwells each of us when we come to Christ, as Peter said there, indwell, the, di the dictionary definition of indwell is to be permanently fixed in someone's soul or mind. To be possessed spiritually. It also has a medical terminology. Medical indwelling is when the needle is put in you and it's not taken out. When they have something that's in you and it stays. That's called indwelling in medical terminology, which I thought was kind of interesting as well but to be permanently fixed. Galatians 3.2 says, This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit from the work, work of the law or by, by hearing with faith? Paul's talking to the Galatians there and says, Okay, all, you have all these confusions about things, but where did the Spirit come from? And the Spirit comes through faith, through acceptance of Christ, through faith. That's it. That's where it comes from. <coughs> Acts 5.32 said, And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. God has given those things to us for the purpose of obedience. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on. God has given us that help. And that help was not something that was available before, but it is now. 1 Corinthians 6.19 is where I'm going to go next. Where's my place here? 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, I have it marked here, do you, know, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought for a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Again, Paul speaking in Corinthians here about the indwelling of the Spirit. And that indwelling he emphasizes there is in your body. It is inside us. It's not something that is just in the Word. It's not something that, that we just talk about. It's something that is inside us. That's part of that individual relationship with Jesus Christ that we have, is that as an individual, we are allowed to receive the Spirit. 
Again, I was reading this morning in the Old Testament, and Moses is talking to the Israelites right before he dies. And he's going through the history of everything. And he says, you know, the prophets are coming, and you need to listen to them because you said you didn't want to talk to God because you're afraid of it. So they'll talk to God for you, so listen to what they say. That's not what Jesus said at all. What Jesus said was, we need to have that individual, personal relationship. And part of that comes through the Spirit. <clears throat> so why why is the why is the spirit available to us? What what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? What purpose does he serve in our lives? Well, the first thing the spirit does, the indwelling does is it's a mark of ownership by God. When we are when we are within the spirit, we are marked by God. Romans 8 and 9 says that, John's, John John 4:13 says that. What it says is that as children of God we are marked by the Spirit. And that Spirit that is within us will change us. I try and say over and over again to people that have not ex- accepted Christ yet, you don't need to change before you accept Christ, you change after you accept Christ. God wants you the way you are, and then when you are indwelt with the Spirit, you become what He wants you to be. That's the key. That's the key to all of this, and to all of Christianity, is that we are meant to be changed by the Spirit. When the Spirit comes within us, we are meant to be changed. Another thing that the Spirit is, is it's a down payment on heaven. In Ephesians 1.13, it says that the Holy Spirit is a pledge from God about what's coming in the future. 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 is where I'm going to go next. Is that where we got it? Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I got too many things marked in my Bible. Verses 4 and 5 says, For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us this very made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. What Paul's saying there, he says this tent, which is interesting because Paul's a tent maker. So it's a reference that he's familiar with. He, Paul builds tents. That's what he did as Paul was a bivocational pastor too. He worked while he was on his missions. And he built tents. And he said, while we're in these, <coughs> this tent, <coughs> this tent, this human body we're in right now, while we're in that, we groan and are burdened because we long for heaven. We know that this is not our home. We know that this is not the way things are supposed to be. We know that we are not living in a place that is fully God. So we groan for that. We want that. But the Holy Spirit is sent as a deposit, as a down payment, if you will. A down payment on heaven. Because we have a closeness to God through the Holy Spirit, our relationship is developing to the point that it should not be strange to us when we're in heaven and we get the, we get in the presence of God. We should have already felt that. That's the deposit. We get to see. We get a peak. We get a peak at heaven when we are truly living within the Spirit. We get a peak at heaven. We get to see it ahead of time. What a blessing that is. What an increase in our hope that will be because we get a chance to see it and feel it through the Holy Spirit. The indwelling comes about when through faith, by grace, we believe. That's it. That's all it takes. And God says, there you go. Let me open a conduit up. Let me open up something for you. Jesus said he had to leave because until he left, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. He recognized the importance of the Holy Spirit right there in that statement. And what he said was, the comforter, the guide, the teacher will come. And while the, the disciples had Jesus outwardly, they were going to get filled inwardly. And I find it interesting that when I look at the disciples in the Gospels, when I look at what they did in the Gospels, it was no different than what Israel had done in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, <coughs> Israel followed God sometimes, listened to God sometimes, 
kind of believed God partially. How many times do we see Jesus talking to his disciples and saying, Oh, ye of little faith. When the man came to him and said, I have a demon-filled child, and your apostles tried, but they didn't quite get it done. They said, i got to come to you. And he said, Oh, guys, you could have done this yourself. But, come here. And he did. Oftentimes he had to explain things to them. He had to talk to them and say, they came to him and said, well, what did you mean by that? What did you mean by that parable? We didn't understand it. We don't get it. Oftentimes they fell. They walked away. Peter was the perfect example. I, I identify with Peter as much as anybody in the Bible. He reached out with a sword and tried and struck an ear off of someone who he was because he thought he had to physically defend Christ. And, and Jesus was like, no, you don't. He said, Lord, surely you won't die. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. <coughs> he denied Christ three times. All those things happened. And when Jesus came back to him after the resurrection and said, do you love me? He was given orders to do something. And yet on the day of Pentecost, nothing had been done yet. They were still kind of batting in the hatches, worried about repercussions coming because they were followers of Christ. And then the miracle of the Holy Spirit happened. That's when everything changed for them. That's when Peter had the audacity and the strength and the courage and the wisdom to go out and speak the Word of God. And once that happened, he never stopped. He never stopped. Christian tradition tells us that Peter was crucified. That was how he was martyred in the end. And tradition tells us that Peter asked and was granted that he be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy of dying the exact same way the Savior did. He was faithful from then on and did not falter because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he was not alone. They all went that way. We never hear about Thomas doubting after the Holy Spirit. We never hear about any of those things again. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit during his conversion on the road to Damascus. And he went from being zealous towards the Christians to being zealous for Christ. And maintained that throughout all of his letters and all of his life as he went on until he was martyred as well. The third thing that the individual does, and this is part of it for them and it's also for us, is that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit helps us overcome our fleshly nature. Now, when, I'm, when I was reading this and I'm going through this, I had two images in my mind. I saw junior high kids during deer time walking down the hallway going to where they're not supposed to be looking over their shoulder to see if anybody's watching. Little kids and going towards the cookie jar until they see somebody watching and then kind of pull it back. Because there's somebody there with them. They know what's right and what's wrong, but as soon as they see someone there that'll hold them accountable, they choose the right. They stop. Okay? It's the same thing if we have a friend that holds you accountable. What a powerful thing that is to have a, so close a relationship with another human being that they can hold you accountable. On your deepest, deepest desires and your deepest secrets and, and your, your weakness and your strength that they hold you accountable. That's the Holy Spirit too. Even greater, that is the Holy Spirit. He is there for all those things to help us and to hold us accountable. Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh sets its, own de sets its desires against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So that you may not not do the things that you that you please. We are all fallen. All of us are sinners. I all fall short of, the, short of the glory of God. As that, we are led to the world. The world wants to take us. Satan's best tool is the distraction of the world. He loves to have us get distracted by the world. And the world says... If it feels good, do it. As long as you don't get caught, it can't be wrong. The world says, you know, look on a woman with lust. It's okay. 
You can steal as long as you don't get caught. You can brag about cheating on your taxes. You can brag about all the things you get away with. Let's honor the guys that make the most money over getting, or getting past everything else. That's not God. That's the world. I had a discussion with uh, the youth group this, this week. We were talking about conflict resolution. <clears throat> and we talked about the current state of professional sports and how everybody knows about the trash talkers and the guys that get into fights and the guys that argue with the refs. Everybody sees that. Everybody knows that. I saw the same thing one day when I was uh, working in the elementary school. I had recess duty with third and fourth graders. I saw third graders trash talking each other. Bad. Where's that coming from? Where's the role model that's teaching these third grade kids to be that nasty and offensive to each other? Because they're playing football on the playground doing little celebration dances and getting in people's faces. What? Where's that coming from? It's not naturally in a child, but that's the world coming out. That's what they're seeing. We also talked about the Walter Payton Award, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. The Walter Payton Award is given to one man in the NFL every year who does the most for his community, for others, outside of the NFL. He does it outside of anything else. They do it on their own. That's that award is presented during the Super Bowl, and it's just a little blip on the radar, and nobody remembers who that person was. But they'll remember the one that made a fool out of himself. They'll remember the one that embarrasses themselves. That's the world. That's the world pulling us that direction. That's the flesh fighting against the spirit. It's rare anymore to see at the end of a football game the players gather around together and drop down on one knee. Both teams get together and pray, and it happens every game. Every game, that happens. The cameras just don't seem to cover that anymore. I remember when they did. They wouldn't even say anything about it. You just see those guys all get out there in a huddle, both teams together and pray. You don't see that anymore because the camera doesn't put it up anymore. It doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means that the world's not showing it to us anymore. The world rarely shows us good news. When you turn on the news, there's not a lot of good stories there. A lot of negative, a lot of controversy, a lot of conflict, but nothing else. So that war is constantly going on between the spirit and the world, the spirit and the flesh. Paul said, every day I die to the flesh. Every day I start over, knowing that I have to deny the evil that's in me so that I can pick up my cross. Every day I have to start over. It's the same for us. There's an old story about uh, a man explaining to his grandson that inside all of us there are two dogs. One's black, one's white, one's evil, one's good. And they're a constant battle inside of us. And the little boy says, well, Grandpa, who wins? And Grandpa said, the one that you feed the most. The one that you feed the most is what's going to win. The spirit is in us, but the world is still actively going. So we have to actively be fighting it. And that's part of the role of the Holy Spirit. If we live within the spirit, that stuff falls away from us. Romans 8.13 says, But I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Paul was very clear in that. If we live by the Spirit, then we will live. There was one unforgivable sin, according to Jesus. Anybody remember what that was? He talked all about other things, and turned the other cheek and everything, but he said there was one, one unforgivable sin. And that was to grieve the Spirit. That was to blaspheme the Spirit. You don't go there. You can say what you want about me, but you don't go there, is what Jesus said. Sometimes we have a tendency to kind of tamp down a little bit on the Spirit. If we want what we want, we try and justify it and stop listening to the Holy Spirit who's telling us what you want is not good for you. What you want is not in God's image. What you want is not what God wants for you. 
Sometimes we get sometimes we get that self righteous anger. That's not from God. That's from us. Anger is anger towards our fellow man is not from us or is not from God. That's not what He wants, and that's not what the Spirit will will uh, manifest in our lives if we're listening to the Spirit and living by the Spirit. But the world will tell us constantly that we need to ignore that, walk away from that. When we get into the Word and we read these things, I pulled out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 verses on the Spirit. 16 New Testament verses on the Spirit. That quickly. If you're in your Word, the Spirit's there. If you're in your Word, the Spirit will speak to you as you are reading God's Word. If you go in the Spirit to the Bible when you read the Word, Revelations will come to you that you never could have seen otherwise. Jane's reading a book right now that just breaks my heart. There is a rabbi who is extremely knowledgeable about Jewish history and even the time of Jesus, Jewish context there. And he, he goes to churches and he speaks and he goes everywhere and he speaks and he uh, talks about all the things that Jesus was talking about in parables and explains things and all the, the Jewish law and everything like that. He has read the New Testament. He's done all that kind of research. And like I said, churches bring him in to speak. He has not accepted Christ. We weren't sure one way or another, so Jane sent him an email. He has all the knowledge in the world, but does not have enough faith to pick it up and go with it. There are a lot of Bible scholars out there who are not believers they are very good at studying the Word as an as a intellectual document or as a historical document, but they have not accepted Christ. And in such, they are not getting the true meaning of what God intended His Word to be. They're missing the insight and the details that are open to us when we let the Spirit speak. The fourth thing and the last thing I'm going to bring up here that the, that the Spirit does is that the Spirit intercedes for us. The, the Spirit will step up and be there between us and God. He will be the one that helps with us, helps us reconcile our nature to God. Romans 8 is where I'm going to go next. These last few verses I think are extremely important if we think about our own life in the Spirit. Romans 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And 27, it says, And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. We talked about prayer the other day, a few weeks ago. We talked about prayer and how sometimes we don't know what to pray or how to pray. The Spirit prays for us in ways that we can't even imagine. If we just open up and say, help me, He's interceding for us. He's going to God for us and working in ways that we can't even, we can't even comprehend. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. What a gift that is. What a gift that is for us to have a helper in that connection with God. Without the Spirit, I think I would fall. I think I would fall. Just because in my own strength, I am nothing. I cannot do it. And I need the Holy Spirit to be there to help me. That's that intercession. Titus 3 is where I'm going to go next. Titus is that little tiny book in the back of the Bible. Titus 3, 4, and 7, 4 through 7, excuse me. But when, the, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously 
through Christ Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Now that word... that the Holy Spirit does here. He says the Holy Spirit renews us. And the word for that in Greek is anachronosis, which simply means renovation. Total renovation. Going back to the fact that we are, our body is supposed to be a temple, we are renovated through the Holy Spirit to be able to accept Christ. We are able to try and walk the way we walk because of the renovation of who we are. We were not born with that ability. We were not born with the ability to truly follow Christ. By faith, through grace, we were saved. And then the Holy Spirit indwelt us, and that's when the change truly happens. That's when it really begins. And every day as we walk in the Spirit, we will grow, and we will get closer and closer and closer to Christ. We get more and more intense in our love of Him, our understanding, and the depth and width and breadth of His love for us. We can't truly understand God's love without the Spirit helping us along. 2 Corinthians 3.18 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot in that little passage, that little statement there. And we who with unveiled places, faces all reflect the Lord's glory. Paul is referring back to Moses at that point in time. Moses, God revealed himself to Moses physically, visually. That hadn't happened. And Moses said, I don't think I can handle it. And he said, I'm going to walk past you so you can see me from behind. And it says in the Bible that Moses came down off the mountain and his face physically glowed from seeing God. His face physically glowed to the point that it was bothersome to people and he wore a veil to dampen that glow. Because people weren't able to... Un- to live with the fact that there was the glory of God there. They couldn't, they couldn't handle seeing it. And Paul says that we who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory. And then he says, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We are being transformed, folks. We are being transformed daily if we are with the Spirit. Things are changing. God's hope and God's intent was that we follow His Son and that we follow the example He set of what He intended mankind to be. He sent Jesus here as an example as well as a sacrifice. If it was just a sacrifice, we wouldn't have, to, we wouldn't have the Gospel showing us all the things He did when He was alive. He could have been born and then died as a sacrifice and it would have been a... No. We had to see what God's intentions were for us. And through the Holy Spirit, we grow closer and closer and closer to that example that Jesus laid for us. We get closer to walking in His footsteps when we seek this. Now the last passage I'm going to bring up is in Galatians. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Galatians 5 is where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And if we think about what is fruit? Well, fruit is the manifestation of growth on a tree. When a tree bears fruit, that means that it's growing. That means that it flowered, that it was pollinated, that it continued to grow until the fruit was there. When I think of fruit, again... Reading in the Old Testament, and I, I looked this up, I had to look this up, um, reading about Joshua and Caleb and the others going over into 
the promised land as scouts and coming back and everybody but Joshua and Caleb saying, oh, they're too big, we can't handle all this. It talks about the giants and all those kind of things. It said they brought back a bunch of grapes and two men carried it on a pole between them. That's a big bunch of grapes if you've got to carry it on a pole. Right now, if I go to the store and get a bunch of grapes, I can put it in one hand. No big deal. That's not the grapes that God has. Right? The, the grapes that God has are huge. Wouldn't it be cool to go into heaven and see grapes the size of grapefruit? That would be awesome. Pete would really like that. He likes grapes. Especially if they're seedless. He doesn't like to spit the seeds out. But thinking about that, that is the fruit of the Spirit. It is above and beyond, more abundantly than what we have now. So let's read what those fruits of the Spirit are. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now there are people in the world that we know that are not in Christ, that may have love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness. There's a lot of really good people out there that aren't Christian. But their fruit is no different than the fruit of the world. Their goodness is only going to be world deep. It doesn't go beyond that. It stays on the outside, it's in the skin. Because the Spirit is not within them. When the Spirit is within them, then the fruit that is born is going to be like that biblical fruit. It is fruit be above and beyond. When it talks about things like patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, especially the self-control part. That ain't happening without the Spirit. But all those other things are manifest much greater than they could be without the help of the Spirit. And the one, the one get the fruit of the Spirit that cannot be had without Christ is peace. Because without the sacrifice, without our salvation, we could have no hope. And if we have no hope, how do we find peace? If there's nothing beyond, how can we find peace where we are? <coughs> when someone tells me they don't believe in life after death, they don't believe in heaven, Boy, what is there then? What's the point of this life? What are we doing here? There's really no reason. But the reason we are here is to spend our time in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, as Paul said, step by step, walking in the Spirit. Step by step, getting closer and closer to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the Spirit says, let me show you Jesus. Let me show you the path to that door that opens. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one's going to get there, and the Spirit's going to take us to him. So that that door opens up for us. Without the Spirit, we don't really understand salvation. Without the Spirit, we really don't understand God's love. There are times in our lives, and many of us have had them, when we actually physically feel the Spirit moving. When we can really feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. You remember those times? It may have been a time of worship. When you were truly in a time of worship, and you can just feel it. And your heart lifts, and you know that the Spirit is there. That is an awesome feeling. It is an awesome feeling. And we would love that feeling to last forever. It will. <coughs> when we're in heaven, that's the way our heart's going to feel. There are so many times in my life when I have felt the Spirit move, and I just, I leak. The tears will come unbidden. They will fall on. And I, I can't stop them. Because I'm so full of a love that I can't find any other place. That comes from the Spirit. And that is that, that is that down payment. That's that peak in heaven. 
And when the Spirit is within us, that's when our face reflects, as Paul said. When God is seen in us. A long time ago, James Dobson asked a rabbi, what would it take for me to convert you to Christ? What would it take for you to accept Christ? He said, make me jealous. Make me, je- make me want what you have. <coughs> well, folks, I'll tell you right now, if God is revealed through you and reflected in your face so that people can see it, if the unveiled, unveiled glory of God is visible in us because of the, the depth and the breadth and the width of the Spirit within us, that's when they're going to see God. And that's when they're going to say, I don't know what you got, but I want it. And we can say, oh, let me tell you about it then. It's easy to get. And when it happens, boy, you're going to be filled up. You are going to be filled up in ways that you can't imagine. The Holy Spirit is here to fill us. To fill us overwhelmingly. I've heard it said before, and I I truly believe it, every single human being is born with a God-shaped hole. There is a hole in every one of us that can only be filled by God. And that hole, the world will try and fill with all sorts of things. Can fill it with greed, can fill it with alcohol, drugs, can fill it with depression and pain. All those things that are so damaging, people are just trying to find God's peace and they're going about it the wrong way. When that hole inside us is filled with the Holy Spirit, inside us is filled with the Holy Spirit, there is no room for any of that other junk. <coughs> now there are those in our lives that are missing that and need that. And until we truly understand it ourselves, we can't explain it. So I'm going to challenge you right now. I'd ask you to just close your eyes and bow your head. I'll make it short, Troy, so you don't fall asleep. (laughs) I want you to sit there and think and listen. Right now, I just want you to listen for the Spirit. Listen for the Holy Spirit to talk to you. Listen for the Holy Spirit to convict you. If there is something that is in the way, that is taking up space inside of you, the Spirit will tell you what it is. The Spirit will convict you and tell you what it is and open up the pathway to get rid of it. If you just stop and listen, ask the Spirit for conviction. Ask the Spirit, say, show me what I need to rid myself of. Show me what I need to make myself more like Jesus. <clears throat> show me that path open the doors focus my eyes fill my heart to the point where it is overwhelming <coughs> to the point where there is nothing left but joy Father we thank you and praise you for your word we thank you for your son for our salvation for the suffering and the death that he died and for the resurrection that came out the other side of that. I thank you so much, Lord, that you have sent the Spirit to us. So that within this new covenant that we have, 